uh, recent work um, on uh, corporate objectives and exit versus voice. There are various titles one could use. Um, whoops, okay, so I have to go. Um, so my talk is based on two papers. Um, uh, one of them with Luigi Zingales that was published in 2017 and another one with Luigi and Eleonora Brocado, which is um, uh, new and um, was written in 2020. We've just revised it. So um, you can find the new version on my website. Both, both papers are on my website. If you just Google Oliver Hart Harvard, you'll, you'll find them. Um, so what's, what's it all about? Um, what we're in, um, a good starting point is to ask, what is the appropriate uh, objective for a firm, um, particularly a public company? A public company, by that I mean a company um, whose shares are traded on uh, a stock market like the London stock market or the New York stock exchange. Uh, so public, it's really a private, it's a, it's a funny terminology, it's a private company, but publicly traded. Um, the traditional view, is that uh, such a company should act on behalf of its shareholders. In fact, um, in most um, economics courses, um, it's just assumed that a company like this, and, and actually firms generally, should just maximize profit. That's the standard assumption uh, we make. Um, recently, though, um, there's been a lot of discussion about this and some disagreement um, with some um, prominent voice is suggesting that companies should have a broader remit. They should um, not just be concerned with uh, their shareholders, but also with other stakeholders, stakeholders um, that covers groups like workers, um, consumers, suppliers, creditors, the local community, etc. The business roundtable in the US, if you follow these things, uh, there was a lot of public, uh, this is a, a group of um, leading CEOs and they um, made a, a big deal about the importance of stakeholders um, about a year ago, a little over. Now, I wanna start off by saying that the idea that companies should act on behalf of stakeholders rather than shareholders, uh, may seem attractive, but it does fly in the face of another idea that many um, people subscribe to, many economists subscribe to, I do myself, which is the idea of freedom of contract. Um, you can really find this idea going back to um, John Stuart Mill's work. Um, I don't know how many of you have read On Liberty. Uh, it's an amazing book. I, I um, I, I can't, I don't think, I certainly hadn't read it at your age, but um, I recommend it. It's quite short and it has the basic ideas that a lot of us believe in, such as that parties um, should be able to write the contracts they like unless there are third party effects, which these days we would call externalities. So if you apply that to a company, um, you would say, well, the person setting up the company, um, you know, think of the moment when it, when it goes public, the initial, the IPO, the initial public offering. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a corporate charter and that the founder can decide um, in that charter, you know, what the rules of the game are going to be for the company. And then the people who buy the shares and, and, um, deal with the company in other ways, know um, what the governance structure is. And so, you know, just as people should be able to write the contracts they like, um, why shouldn't the founders be able to um, determine the governance, the governance structure they want? Um, so if you're a founder, you can choose your governance structure to be one where uh, workers um, have boats or board seats or consumers do um, rather than shareholders um, or maybe you have a mix um, or you can <clears throat> decide that you want your company to be a non-profit um, rather than a, just a 
standard for-profit company. Um, these are decisions you can make. Um, most of the time, public companies um, are not set up in that way. They're set up in a sort of rather bread and butter fashion with the votes um, being allocated to shareholders. Shareholders are the unique group that can elect um, directors. So um, to me, that means, well, okay, we should, we, re we should respect that. It seems that most of these companies are not set up in a way um, that gives power to stakeholders generally. Rather, the power is um, put in the hands of the shareholders. And to, so to me, that means, again, you know, putting aside some obvious externalities that um, the company um, should, yeah, uh, act on behalf of the shareholders, right? Because they have the votes. That's the way the company's set up. We should respect that. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's just go with that um, then for the moment, at least, um, actually throughout the talk. Um, the next question is, okay, if the company should act on behalf of shareholders because that's the way the company was set up, um, what do the shareholders want? Well, most finance and legal scholars and economists too, actually have said, well, you know, it's clear what uh, shareholders want. They want uh, as much uh, profit as possible. They want to be as wealthy as possible. Um, that's, that's uh, and, and therefore that's what the company should do. It should maximize profit or market value. Um, one of the most, um, famous exponents of this, I suppose famous both because he is very famous and also because the article he wrote uh, has become very famous. So Milton Friedman, who actually <laughs> didn't spend much of his working life um, thinking about these issues, but in 1970, he wrote an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, um, where he laid out the case for companies uh, maximizing profit. And um, here's a quote from him. The responsibility of a corporate executive is to conduct business in accordance with shareholders' desires, which generally will be to make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of the society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. Um, the reason Friedman wrote this um, at the time was there was a lot of discussion then about um, companies having, that they should have a broader purpose than just the bottom line. And indeed, CEOs were um, arguing this themselves, but Friedman um, sort of counter-argued that, no, this is completely wrong. Their business is to make money for their shareholders. Okay, there you have a picture of Milton Friedman. Um, okay, now, it turns out, though, that and this is what uh, Luigi Zingales and I argued in our 2017 paper. Um, I'm not suggesting we were the first people who ever argued this, um, we weren't, but I think we made the point in a sharper and clearer way than it had before. Basically we said, um, yes, let's accept that companies should act on behalf of shareholders, but it doesn't follow that that means the company should maximize profit because maybe the shareholders don't want that. And to, to explain that idea, let us recognize that um, shareholders of these companies are ordinary people like you and me. And um, we have social as well as monetary goals. We're not ourselves only interested in our wealth. Um, now these days, a lot of the largest um, shareholders actually are institutions, um, but behind those institutions, there are again, um, ordinary people. The people who invest in the institution are um, ordinary people with complicated, um, multifaceted goals. And just to understand this um, a little more, um, consumers, so shareholders are also consumers. Consumers 
um, some of them buy electric cars rather than gas guzzlers because they care about the environment. So let me just say, when I'm, I'm getting into, uh, when I talk about the fact that shareholders may not just be interested in the bottom line, I'm particularly interested here in things like the environment, that they care about the environment, they want a cleaner environment. And if you look at their own actions, individual actions, well, they buy electric cars rather than gas guzzlers. Um, they use less water in their house or garden than is privately optimal because they recognize that water is a scarce good. Um, many people buy fair trade coffee, um, even though it's more expensive and maybe no better than regular coffee. They buy chicken from a free range farm rather than a factory farm because they uh, care about the well being of the chickens. So, um, you know, if people are willing to um, not, you know, not just cost minimize in their private lives or profit maximize, they are uh, interested in other things, then um, uh, you, it would seem to follow uh, why, um, I mean, it would suggest that they would also want the companies that they own to do the same. You know, there's no real difference between uh, your own individual actions and the, the actions of the companies. Um, now, Friedman's leading example um, against this idea, against that companies should act socially, um, was the case of charity. So um, at that time, companies, and they're probably still true, um, were giving uh, significant amounts to charity. And he said, um, this makes no sense. To paraphrase his argument, it would be better for the, a company to take that amount and hand it to shareholders in the form of a higher dividend. And then each shareholder can use that extra amount to contribute to his or her favorite charity. That would seem to be much more efficient and, and more democratic actually, because if the company does it, they're probably gonna be giving it to the CEO's favorite charity. Um, where, whereas you know, if it's handed out as a dividend, then each person can choose their own charity. Um, so this actually was a, is a powerful argument, I think, but it turns out that charitable contributions are a very special case. Um, and his conclusion is no longer valid if um, money making and ethical activities are non separable. And um, let me explain what I mean by that with a couple of examples. So here's a uh, sadly highly topical but also a peculiarly American example, uh, consider a, re a retailer that sells military style rifles in its store. And you, you know, you will have read about the um, storming of the Capitol and the fact that there are all these people who seem to have a lot of weapons and they get them, um, you know, maybe they get them from this retailer that I'm talking about now. Uh, and it's perfectly legal um, to sell a lot of these weapons. Um, so imagine you're a shareholder of this retailer and you're concerned about all these people being armed. Um, and the retailer has to decide whether to sell these, these, these uh, weapons or not. Um, as I say, let's assume it's legal. Let's suppose it's, it's money making to do it. Um, the Friedman argument would be, well, in that case, they should do it, they should maximize profit, and then they can hand the extra profit out to you, your increased dividend, and then if you care about gun control, you can use that money, you can hand it to gun control organizations who will try to, um, you know, get the guns off the streets or encourage people to hand over their weapons or something like that. Well, um, you know, as, as, as I say it, it's obvious this is uh, ridiculous, this argument. Um, it may be much, if you are a shareholder who thinks there should be few of these weapons available, it'd be much more efficient for you, uh, you know, if, if this retailer just didn't sell them in the first place. Um, the cost of getting them off the streets once they're on the, once they're on the streets may far exceed the profit that the company makes from putting them on the streets in the first place. So if you if you could vote on this, and I'm going to be talking about voting later, you would actually vote. You would say, "I'm willing to sacrifice some profit um, in order to have uh, fewer guns sold in the stores." Um, to take another example, think of a company that can make a profit by polluting a lake, 
Maybe in another country where this is perfectly legal, um, again, um, Friedman's argument would be, uh, okay, it should do so, hand profit, the extra profit to the shareholders, and then they can go and clean up the lake if they want. Well, again, uh, the cost of doing that can be uh, you know, far in excess of the profit that the company made in the first place. And in case you think this kind of example is far-fetched, let me just mention that um, this describes uh, Texaco's behavior in Ecuador, uh, where they extracted oil and uh, did a lot of damage to the environment. And it was legal, but uh, a lot of people thought it was a bad idea. Um, Texaco uh, did not ask its shareholders whether they would they wanted this. It's not clear they would have wanted it. They might have said, no, we actually care about the environment in Ecuador. Now, um, before I go on, it's, uh, let me make an important point here is that uh, here, which is, and this is, I, I'm sure something, uh, well, I don't know what, you, you know, you're different years, um, at LSE or other places, you've done different amounts of economics, but uh, I would assume some or maybe all of you have come across the idea of externalities and how to um, deal with them. One way to deal with them is through Pigovian taxes. Um, and, you know, the government uh, basically imposes a tax so that a company that, uh, for example, contributes to global warming or uh, hurts the environment in some other way, has to pay the damage that it is doing. So it's sort of taxed in the amount of the harm it, it causes. Now, if you had a system in place, then my argument uh, wouldn't be necessary because the company would already internalize the externality. We think of Texaco um, extracting oil, it's going to do some damage to the environment, but um, ideally it would have to pay for that. And so then it would decide, um, you know, is it worth it? Is the value of the oil minus the damage um, greater than zero? And if it's uh, um, if the damage is large, the answer would be no, and it wouldn't do it. Um, and then, you know, profit maximization and social um, welfare maximization coincide, and um, people with pro-social uh, you know, who's socially conscious, um, they could just say, I'm happy for my company to maximize profit because the company would be already uh, taking into account, account all these social effects through these Pigovian taxes. But um, I think we're, you know, to rely on governments to um, solve the problem that way um, seems to me kind of heroic. Um, these days, we have a lot of political gridlock. Um, and for the kinds of problems I'm talking about, you don't just need national governments to get it right. You need coordination between all the different national governments, which is, you know, incredibly hard. If you think of, um, so a lot of a lot of economists think we should have a carbon tax. That would be the way to deal with climate change. But um, progress on this is extremely slow, even at the uh, national level. Uh, let alone the international level. So in the meantime, I think individuals and companies have uh, a role to play along the lines that I'm talking about. Um, okay, um, so, so that's a sort of background. Now, the, so if you sort of accept what I've been saying, then the idea is, well, shareholders uh, may want firms not to just maximize profit. They may want them to act in a socially responsible manner because they have a, I just want to get, uh, put the term comparative advantage on the table because the examples I gave, just to come back to Friedman's example, why are they different from the charity example? Um, the reason is that the, in the, the firm's charitable contribution is completely separable from anything else it's doing, from its business. Uh, and that's why Friedman was, was right in that case. But when it comes to a retailer selling weapons or Texaco or some company polluting a lake, um, the, um, the profit-making activity and the activity which creates social harm are um, interlinked. So that's why uh, the firm has a comparative advantage in being socially responsible in that case, um, as opposed to charity. Um, okay, so what can shareholders do to push firms in the right direction? Um, there are two main mechanisms, um, exit or voice. Um, voice, 
refers to using their voting power or engaging with management in other ways. So I've already mentioned that shareholders have votes. Typically, that's they allocated the votes, and only they are. So they could, in principle, use their voting power to push management. Um, exit refers to uh, div things like divestment. So um, the way I uh, show that I want um, the companies I invest in to be clean is I basically say, I'm only going to invest in clean companies. If you're a dirty company, I'm not going to invest in, in with you. And if I, if I have invested you uh, in you in the past, I'll just sell my shares. So the, um, you, one reads a lot about divestment campaigns um, in the newspapers. And um, by the way, consumers um, and workers can also do this kind of thing. They can um, pursue an exit strategy by boycotting um, the product of a dirty form, firm or well, working and refuse to work for a dirty firm. Um, so um, in the second paper that we wrote, that I wrote with uh, Eleonora and Luigi, um, it's called Exit versus Voice because we compare these strategies. So I want you to, to focus on that now. Wh which is the better way to get companies to be socially responsible? Um, is it better to um, divest or boycott or is it better um, as a shareholder to use your voice. Now, um, I'm going to illustrate um, the effectiveness of voice with a simple example. So unfortunately, because time is short, I'm not gonna have a chance to say too much about exit. Um, I'm gonna say more about voice. Uh, but one reason that that may not be so bad is that um, people talk much less about voice. And so it, 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 I think it's underappreciated. And here I want to show you why actually um, it can work quite well. Um, so here's a very simple three date model. The model in the paper on my website is uh, more elaborate than this. And it's also one where we consider exit. Uh, but as I say, can't uh, time prevents that today. But so this is a very stripped down version of what's in that paper. So. Um, Consider a company that is initially owned 100% by a founder. So I mentioned, you know, these companies, you know, were once they start off as small companies, they get bigger, uh, you know, something like Google, and uh, they go public. And at that point, you know, the founder, uh, before that, let us suppose that the founder owns everything, uh, which is probably not true because venture capitalists would typically own something, but let's not worry about that. Um, the founder, owns 100%, but then um, I'm going to assume, and this is also not very realistic, but we'll do for our purposes, that the, the founder gets out of the company. The founder is going to sell all her shares to a large number of small um, risk-neutral shareholders. Okay. Um, now, um, this is in this very simple example, there's no uncertainty. So the company is expected um, to make a profit equal to 100 at day two. So 100 can just be perfectly certain, actually, for the, uh, it could, I suppose, be a random variable, you know, the expectation could be 100. But just think of it as the company is going to make 100. Um, that's what everybody thinks, at least, at date two. Um, now, if we assume a zero interest rate, then the price of shares at date zero will be 100, right? Because you're getting 100 at date two, you discount that at a zero interest rate and you get net present value is 100. Okay, so that's what the, um, the new shareholders pay for the company. So the founder just gets 100 uh, pounds and then retires. Um, now at date one, so there are three dates, at date one, the middle date, to everyone's surprise, it's learned um, that climate change is a problem and that this company will cause environmental damage equal to 30 um, if it's operating the way people expect it. So I want to model this as a surprise. This is not a rational expectations um, equilibrium that we're looking at here, although in the, in the paper, we do consider the case of rational expectations, expectations, expectations as well. But I think this is not unrealistic that, you know, people back in the day, they didn't know climate change was going to be a problem. And then, um, they got the bad news. Yes, it is. So, okay, so I want you to uh, assume this is a, a surprise event. And I also want to suppose that this environmental damage is 
barely felt by the shareholders themselves. This is something which affects the world. So, you know, it affects mainly other people, only a tiny bit, the shareholders themselves. Or at least, you know, the aggregate impact is much greater than the impact on these, on the shareholders. Um, all right, so now, oops. Now, I want to assume the company can avoid the problem, the damage, by spending 20. So there's a way for this company to become clean and eliminate this 30 pounds of damage. So, you know, everything is measured in money here. This is the way economists doing, do things. Um, and so the question is, should the company do it? <clears throat> now, notice um, that a benevolent planner, so, you know, we often talk about a, a, a social planner or something like that, someone who maximizes aggregate welfare, um, such a planner would, of course, do it because at a cost of 20, you eliminate damage equal to 30. So this is, it's obviously a positive net present value thing to do. Um, cost benefit analysis says do it. Um, but I want to assume that we don't have a planner. Um, this is a bit like saying we don't have governments that uh, can coordinate on um, uh, ideal Pigovian taxes. So uh, we're just assuming that the, go the government is, is not operating the way we'd like. And so it's left up, up to individuals and individual companies to decide these matters. Um, okay, so I want to suppose that the date one shareholders uh, who are these little people who bought the shares from the founder at date zero, you know, they now move on to date one, they wake up to this problem. And let's suppose they they vote on whether to install the clean technology. So this is um, voice at work. This is what I mean by voice, that the thing is put to uh, an up or down vote. Now, I've mentioned that um, we, I think of, and my co-authors and I think of, um, individuals as being at least, um, some of them, um, somewhat socially responsible in the sense that they're not only interested in themselves. Um, that's the example, you know, I gave the examples of buying electric cars, uh, cars rather than gas casters, and all those other examples are ones where you're not uh, totally self-interested. So we want to allow for that. So the way we model that is that we suppose that when somebody makes a decision, um, they put 100% weight on the impact of, this, of that decision on themselves, but they also put a weight lambda on the welfare of other people affected by the decision, where lambda is between zero and one. Okay, so um, someone who is um, totally self-interested has a land of zero. Uh, they don't put any weight. They put weight zero on, on everybody else. Only, um, they only care about themselves. Somebody who is an altruist, a sort of pure altruist, would put weight uh, one, land equals one. They would weight the effect on other people um, the same way as they weight the impact on themselves. But by allowing lambda to be between zero and one, we can capture different degrees of altruism. So, um, okay, so let's take a topical example to see how this works. Um, uh, think of the, the decision to wear a mask in a situation where, let's say, it's not um, legally required. Um, and Let's suppose that people don't like wearing masks. So there's a, a cost to me of wearing a mask of 10, but I'm going to uh, sort of bump into people um, and the benefit to them of me wearing a mask is 50. Okay, so I will decide, I will say to myself, you know, should I put on the mask? Well, um, it's minus 10 for me if I put on the mask, but it's a plus 50 for, others and I weight that by lambda. So I consider, I put on the mask as long as minus 10 plus 50 lambda is positive. In other words, I put on the mask um, as long as lambda is bigger than a fifth. Um, so this is the way I'm going to assume people behave when they make decisions. And um, okay. Now back to the vote. 
Um, so we're voting on whether the company should become clean at cost 20, but uh, helping the environment by the amount of 30. So um, one question we have to ask is, well, you know, how do people vote given that, um, you know, they're not, they're not the only person voting? Um, we're going to, uh, we assume that each vote, each shareholder votes as if she was pivotal. Um, the reason for that, I think it's a reasonable assumption in this context, uh, let me justify it. Um, when you vote, um, most of the time your vote doesn't make any difference, right? Because they'll, you know, you're going to be, uh, you're not going to be the pivotal voter. Um, but the, uh, the only time it does make a difference is when you're pivotal. So you may as well vote as if you were making the decision because the rest of the time it doesn't matter. So that's why I'm gonna suppose that people actually um, work out whether they want um, the firm to become clean. And if they want it to become clean, they vote clean. And if they want it to become, to stay dirty, they vote dirty. So, okay, now let's, all right. So consider a typical shareholder and let's suppose this person owns a fraction theta of the firm. And I'm going to use this, this lambda methodology to figure out whether this shareholder wants the firm to become clean. So um, she says to herself the following, well, um, if the firm becomes clean, um, it's going to incur a cost of 20, which is going to come out of that profit of 100, you know, the next period. Uh, to put it another way, the value of the shares of the company will fall by 20, you know, from 100 to 80, in fact. So um, as someone who owns a fraction of the of the firm, you're going to ex experience a capital loss equal to 20 times theta, 20 times the uh, fraction you own. So you don't like that. On the other hand, you say to yourself, well, but there could be some good effects on others. Well, let's look at the effects on everybody else in the world. Um, first of all, let's consider your fellow shareholders. Well, they also experience a capital loss. In fact, the capital loss they experience is 20 times one minus theta because they own the rest of the firm. And you care about that because you care about everybody, right, a bit. But you also realize, but you know, there's going to be this improvement in the environment of 30. And you know, you care about that. So put it all together. And I'm going to argue that you will vote clean, that is, you will want the clean outcome as long as minus 20 theta. So that's the direct impact on you. Plus, the indirect impact, which is plus 30. That's the good things happening to the environment, minus the capital loss on your fellow shareholders experience, 20 times one minus theta, and that indirect term all gets multiplied by lambda, right? How much you care about other people than yourself. So as long as that whole expression on the left-hand side is positive, you will vote clean. If it's negative, you will vote dirty. Okay, so I've just written that up again, same thing there, the first bullet point. And if you just um, rearrange that, um, you get lambda uh, bigger than 20 theta. I'm putting the 20 theta on the right-hand side. The, the thing in the, in the brackets there is 30 minus 20 plus 20 theta, which is 10 uh, plus 20 theta. So that now goes on the denominator. So um, that's the formula for um, whether you will um, vote clean. So what it says is, um, you know, it all depends on your theta and on your lambda. And I want to imagine, you know, lambda is distributed in the population. I'm, um, we don't have a theory as to where lambda comes from. We just assume people are born to be more or less selfish. Um, now, one of the, th the, so the thing that's rather striking about this, um, at least it was not something we had expected until we set it up this way, is that if theta is very small, and remember, my story was the founder sells uh, her stake to a large number of small shareholders. Um, think of people who, you know, who uh, uh, 
who hold diversified portfolios. Uh, you yourselves may be too young to be um, share, uh, owners of companies, but um, you know when you get older and you uh, start saving for your pension and so on, you will um, you may well be finding yourself. Um, investing in index funds, which hold a tiny little bit of every, well, they hold actually a lot of every company, but since you will be um, holding a little piece of the index fund, you will end up holding a really, really small um, share of every company that's traded, let's say, in, in, on the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange. And so your theta for a particular company will be extremely small you know, point oh, 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 I can't even do it, right, one. And um, so now think about that. Uh, if, than, if theta is uh, close to zero, then the right-hand side of that, 20 theta over 10 plus 20 theta, is approximately zero. Um, the implication then is that a small shareholder will vote clean as long as their lambda is positive, you know, unless it, uh, 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 unless it's incredibly close to zero, um, because the right hand side is almost zero. Even people who are um, pretty selfish, extremely selfish, as long as they're not totally selfish, will vote clean, which is uh, kind of surprising, at least a surprising to us result. But it's just because the capital gain term, the personal capital loss term it, it, when theta is very small is approximately zero. And so um, it's the second term, the lambda times what's in the parentheses that um, dominates. And what's in the parentheses is, is basically 30 minus 20. Notice that if the cost of turning the firm clean exceeded 30, let's say it was 40 to make the firm clean, then um, you would get the opposite result. Everyone would vote dirty. But either way, they're voting for the socially correct thing. They're doing exactly what the benevolent planner would do. Um, OK, this turns out to be a, a fairly general result, as you can uh, find if you look at the paper. Now, I want to stress, um, it is important that these people are small shareholders. I mean, if theta was one, then you would find lambda would have to be bigger than two thirds for a 100% you know, shareholder to go for the uh, clean technology. Such a person would have to be quite altruistic to do it. But for small shareholders, uh, they're almost all going to do it. So that means that the vote will actually lead to a good outcome. So this is what's good about voice. Now, um, let me um, say a few words about exit. I'm, I'm going to try to finish in the next um, seven minutes. So, um, I, 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 so here, with since we're talking about shareholders, um, then uh, we don't have boycotts by consumers in the model. But we do in um, if you look at the the paper with the two co-authors, you'll find um, boycotts are analysed. But here. Um, I want to compare voice with divestment. And as I said, I don't really have time to say much about it, um, except to I want to um, suggest to you that divestment is going to be typically much less effective. And the reason is that the way divestment works is that if you um, announce that you're going to sell shares in a firm unless it becomes clean, um, then what's going to happen is that the, the share price will fall, okay, because you're getting out. That's put some downward pressure on the share price. And a value maximizing manager, so imagine um, you're the manager of a company which is currently dirty and you see people divesting from it. Um, and you, you may be, you know, on some sort of incentive scheme, you were encouraged to to, to maximize value because that's what everybody thought or profit that's what uh, people thought was the right thing and now you find that oh but people don't like the shares of my company because I'm a dirty company so the share price falls and um, because you you know you're so you're from an incentive point of view you're worse off because you were incentivized with shares in the company to make you do the right thing and now you find that your wealth is going down as a manager you don't like that so if that goes down enough if the share price goes down enough because nobody wants to hold the shares you might induced be induced to to become clean simply to get your uh, share price up 
Okay, it's a bit like, um, maybe it's easier to understand in the case of boycotts. I mean, if I'm a company that is making a dirty product and now suddenly a lot of people won't buy it, um, my profits will fall. So even if I'm a profit maximizer, I don't care at all about uh, social things. I'm purely selfish myself, but I suddenly find my, you know, I'm not making as much money as before. In order to woo these companies, uh, these um, consumers back, I become clean. I'm willing to incur costs because that's the way um, I get people to buy my product again. That's the mechanism. But the problem with that mechanism is that, let's go back to divestment. Um, if I divest, there are going to be many people who are um, not very altruistic, who will be willing to buy my shares. You know, once the share price goes down a bit, um, this company becomes a bargain. And so ordinary investors who don't are not, you know, strongly social will jump at the opportunity to make money by buying the shares of the company. And so the share price will not go down very much at all before it starts going up again. And that's why actually divestment uh, is doesn't work very well. Uh, you need a lot of very socially uh, responsible, very altruistic people for divestment to work. Um, in contrast to the case of voice, where, um, as we saw, even um, you know somebody with a, a slightly positive lambda will vote the right way. Um, let me just emphasize that um, if you have a small positive lambda, but the share price goes down, um, not buying that share at the lower price when when the profits of the company are still the same as before, um, you are really losing a lot of money. So it's not the same calculation as in the case of voice. Anyway, um, I don't have, um, we can talk about this a bit more perhaps during the, the question period, but the, the basic, the bottom line is that exit is a very indirect way of getting companies to change. It's the, the mechanism is you, ha you have to drive the share price down and hope that the company as a share price maximizer will see the light of day and become clean in order to bring the share price back up. But um, typically there are just too many other people who will buy the shares from you without a significant price reduction. And so it, it's not gonna work. Um, okay, now I just um, briefly let me um, say a, a few other things, make some qualifications and then, and then uh, conclude. Um, the, the sort of thrust of the, of the talk then, and certainly of these papers, is that um, voice look can be much better than people think because they don't talk about it so much. Voice, engagement, getting companies to change their behavior. Exit, saying, I'm just going to sell my shares, is a very indirect mechanism and, and uh, perhaps shouldn't be, um, one shouldn't uh, do that so easily. Um, but I don't want to say that exit's never the right thing. Um, sometimes exit can work well. Um, I think it works well um, if you can get a, a campaign going so that everybody feels obliged to join in and that can really put pressure on a company. So um, it's easier to come up with examples on the consumer side. Um, so uh, as one example, consider the fur free campaign by the Humane Society. So basically the way that works is um, people um, boycott you know, companies that make fur coats and there may not be that many of them, but if the campaign um, builds up steam, then uh, let's say I, who you know like to walk around with a fur with a fur coat, uh, not true, but you can imagine it. Um, I don't really care about this campaign, but the trouble is, once enough people um, are into it, then if I wear my fur fur coat, people are going to hiss at me, and they won't be my friends and they'll shun me and that's very unpleasant. And so actually um, my preferences get changed by the actions of others. So I think there are some situations like that where a, a boycott or more generally an exit campaign can work, but they, they aren't um, you know, that common. Um, the other thing is that voice can easily be restricted. 
in a way that exit can't. So, um, you know, you can always decide not to buy a product or um, to sell your, the shares of a, of a tobacco company or something. Um, nobody can stop you doing that. Whereas, uh, in fact, if you try to exercise voice, um, certainly in the US, um, there are many things that get in your way, many impediments. So it turns out, for example, that shareholder proposals on things like the environment um, are not binding. Um, and, um, you know, even if, uh, you know, 80% of the shareholders voted for a company to um, reduce um, oil production um, or, you know, getting oil out of the ground, uh, voted for Texaco to do that, it wouldn't be binding on um, the Texaco board. It's, it's advisory. And that's uh, because the Secur Security and Exchange Commission has, has made regulations um, to be that, made the regulations to be that way. It doesn't have to be like that, but it is like that at the moment. Um, voice is also infeasible. I mean, if you're trying to um, change the behavior of Facebook, to take a, a very topical example, or uh, something like uh, the Coke Industries, um, these are private companies. Um, well, sorry, Coke is private. Facebook, of course, is not private, but it has a controlling investor. Mark Zuckerberg has control. So um, even if all the other shareholders voted uh, for um, Facebook to change its behavior, um, this is something that um, Zuckerberg can veto because Facebook has two classes of shares and he has um, the majority of the votes. Um, so there are some cases where voice is, is cannot work and then exit may be, you know, the only alternative. But um, in other cases, I think voice should be at attempted. And so just to move now to, um, you know, things we uh, perhaps closer to you or to me, um, we work for institutions, universities, um, Harvard um, has announced that it's uh, getting out of dirty companies. Uh, Cambridge University has said it's doing that. I don't know what LSE, um, what its investment policy is. I don't know how, what it owns, to be honest. Um, I haven't a clue, you may know. But, um, you know, a lot of universities are under pressure from students to divest. I would suggest that a better strategy might be to stay with the companies and try to change their behavior by putting pressure on management uh, through voting or for that matter, just through um, um, engaging in other ways. So a lot of engagement can take place um, behind, behind closed doors. Um, so, okay, I think um, rather than talking about mission statements, maybe that'll come up in the um, questions, but um, the discussion, but let me just, um, sort of conclude by saying that, um, you know, Milton Friedman wrote this article in 1970 saying uh, business people should just keep their heads down, focus on the bottom line. Um, the world has changed. I think we've realized that theoretically uh, Friedman's argument uh, is not always correct uh, when, when ethical um, activities and money-making activities are, are um, not separable, his argument's wrong. And um, so there is a reason for shareholders to want other things than just for their companies to make money. And we're seeing just a huge amount of activity now um, by people who want to change company behavior. I think they are, uh, a lot of it is through exit, but I would suggest that, that voice is, is something that, that needs to be seriously considered. Um, let me stop there. And uh, sorry, I went on a bit long. No worries at all. Thank you very much, Professor Hart, um, for your wonderful insights into the um, welfare implications of these two strategies. Let's now open the floor to questions. Um, again, let me remind you that we have quite a large audience today, audience today so please use the um, raise hand function. It's at the bottom of the, of the screen. If you click on reactions, the smiley face, then you will see the um, raise hand function. I will then ask you to unmute yourself and then out the question. Okay. Um, um, would you would you like to um, unmute yourself and ask? Um, we have one odd one student from the audience raising his hand. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hart. This is uh, really uh, uh, this is a great lecture. I have two questions. Uh, so the first is, I'd love to know whether 
institutional investors can sort of uh, their decision to exit a voice can uh, if uh, element of game theory can have a play here to give you an example blackrock had put out a letter for its shareholders and this really was a game changer among a lot of in, uh, investors uh, across uh, the world so something like this how does one in uh, one big investors uh, why uh, decisions sort of affect the others uh, the second is i think in a lot of countries and in a lot of different industries uh, the industry that is the problem can also be the solution uh, to give you an example uh, i come from india and um, the biggest polluter in terms of coal is a company called adani but they also the largest institute uh, they they also the largest investors in renewable energy right so as an in, as a, as a as an investor you could have a dilemma whether to stay or to leave because it's because they have a natural monopoly in the energy industry as a whole so what do you do in this case okay yeah uh, both good questions i i would say on the first one um yes blackrock it was larry fink who runs blackrock the ceo um who made some statements suggesting that uh, blackrock would be um putting pressure on companies to be uh, you know more concerned about the environment not just concerned about profit um exactly how much that has happened i think is debated so some people think this is sort of kind of greenwashing or you know that it's signaling stuff but it's not or, or virtue signaling or whatever people call it and it's not real not that real um but either way i would say um that in the case of I mean, I, my view is that in a way it's good that larry you know if if he's serious it's good that he's doing this but um it shouldn't be the question is whose social preferences should matter um you know when he talks to uh ceos um should he be telling them about his own social preferences in other words what his trade off is between money and doing good things for the environment i don't think so i think it should be the preferences of his investors in other words what bothered me about larry fink was that he wasn't saying wait a minute i should go back to my investors because i'm actually acting on their behalf and that's um that i think is the right way to do it um which we we not i think we yes we're not hearing enough of that the uh, so that's the the first point um the second point actually i think is um I'm I'm really glad you raised it because I think you you gave an example where a company um could actually be doing some good things as well as bad things. And then um exit could be a very sort of crude solution to that or you know reaction to that whereas voice could in principle be much um more finely tuned in other words the shareholders could say um you know we we like you what you're doing on the renewable side but we'd like you to do as well a bit less on the dirty side and so they could actually just push for some marginal changes rather than sort of being in or out um let me say that what what we have in what i have in mind um in terms of voice uh, you know in the future what i could imagine is companies um actually going to their shareholders and asking them about trade offs and sort of getting their preferences um for for big decisions like and 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 this could be you know one whether to drastically cut back on uh, non-renewable things and this is something that uh, you could have an up or down vote on and and then you know as i say you could make adjustments rather than all or nothing thank you professor i'm a big fan thank you Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hart. Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, you can feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask. Okay, um, please unmute yourself, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. I think you're um, still muted or your audio isn't working very well. Uh, 
Oh, is this a bit better? Yes. Yeah. And okay, I come from that. Okay, great. Um, so I asked my question way up there in the chat. And my question was, would it be more effective to hold a company legally responsible by a government instead of morally responsible by shareholders? Um. Yeah, I mean, this is what I, I this 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 relates to what I was saying about Pigovian taxes. I mean, um, in a way, that would be the ideal solution. You know, assuming the government can get it right. Um, I think when you say legally responsible, I think you have in mind that. Um, I mean, you need the right law, but I mean, if you can have, a, it's like saying uh, we're going to have a carbon tax. So if you um, emit so many tons of carbon, you have to pay this amount. And that reflects the marginal damage you're doing to the environment. So uh, in a way, that's the perfect solution. And, and I'm not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't be pushing forward with that. Um, what I'm saying is that I think that in practice, um, you know, governments aren't perfect. And um, they don't do the things that they should be doing. And given that, you know, it's, it's fine to keep pushing them, but at the same time, you know, in a way we need to push on all dimensions. Um, you know, you could imagine a world where we wouldn't have um, individual charitable contributions because the government would have sorted out the problem. Uh, you know, that's actually probably the case in a standard economic model that the government, you know, the benevolent planner will, um, you know, deal with poverty. And so you don't need or, you know, you don't need food kitchens or food pantries or whatever you give money to, uh, because the government has already provided that service. But obviously, we're not in that world, because people do give to charity. And as I say, they also, uh, you know, buy, buy the free range chicken and all this kind of thing. And so in that world, I think they also want their companies to do the right thing. So we, ha we have to just uh, operate on all these different dimensions. Very clear. Thank you very much for your uh, answer. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I see a chat from the room, Robinson. Um, a, a question in the chat. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask, please? Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I'll probably go with my second question, which was about, um, let's say, like a company, because we go like kind of making that transition into clean energy and things of that nature, it can be expensive. And so investments would need to be made. So I was just wondering, like, in terms of the divestments, the exit kind of section, do you feel like it could be counterproductive in the sense that if everyone starts kind of exiting a stock and making the price go down, it reduces the ability for the company to raise capital through secondary offerings, maybe even makes it harder for them to raise debt because of the fact that it's now it seems like a risky company due to everyone kind of divesting. I was kind of wondering what your opinions were on that. Well, that's what I think you've hit the nail on the head. But in a way, that is the way it's um, you've described. Uh, you said something that I didn't really ha have time to say, but I'm glad you said it, which is that one of the ways divestment is meant to work. You know, I talked about it drives down the market price and that hurts the managers who let's say own shares and therefore they decide, oh, we're gonna become clean to get the price up. But similarly, you, you hurt a company by raising its cost of capital. So the mechanism you've described is how divestment is uh, meant to um, have an impact on companies. Um, what you're suggesting is it could sort of also make the companies um, you know, make it harder for them to do the right thing. But I think what I would say is, that the, the answer to that would be, could be, well, but look, once they say we're gonna do the right thing, those investors will come back. Because the whole point of the exit was, um, you know, we don't want to hold uh, oil stocks because oil's dirty, but if the company announces that it's going to um, move into, you know, wind and solar, and, and the renewables, then, um, you know, Harvard University will say, oh, okay, we're coming back. And so the price will go up again. So I think maybe that could solve the problem you're talking about. Um, 
but it, it's certainly possible that in the short run it could work the way you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, um, Raja, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah. Hi, Professor um, Hart. Uh, I just had a question about the um, voice uh, model that you presented. Would you say that it's um, akin to sort of a cozy bargaining between um, the shareholders and the firm itself? And in that case, would you not have all the limitations of a cozy bargaining as well, such as like assigning the property rights off, uh, because of those externalities? Um, I'm glad you raised that too. Actually, um, we have a section in the paper, the new version of the paper, which is December 2020, which is on the website, where uh, where we talk about cozy and bargaining. Um, but I think, and what we argue is, it's actually very different. So, um, cozy and bargaining would require, I think, a group of people, not shareholders, anybody could go to a firm, and say look, um, we'll pay you to become clean because we're socially responsible people. We have lambdas, maybe our lambdas are fairly high. So we care about the environment. Of course, we don't like to pay, but if the harm you're doing is, is big enough or our lambdas are large enough, then as a group, we would be willing to um, compensate you for becoming clean. So that's the way um, a possible co-solution to this. Um, but um, the problem with that we, uh, is that, um, you know, imagine it would take a group of 20 people to do it or something. Um, the question is which group of 20 would do it? I mean, let, imagine, you know, there are lots of potential groups of 20 people who could go or 100 people or 1000 people or whatever it is, who could go to the company and propose such a thing. But I would certainly like uh, I, I might be willing as uh, to be a member of that group, but I much prefer other people to be in the group. So, you know, a, no, a group not including me to do that job because then um, the outcome would be the same, but I wouldn't have to pay. So, you know, people would sort of be jockeying not to be the members of the group that goes into the cozy and bargain with the firm. Um, in contrast, so that's why I think there's uh, many reasons to think that's not going to work. Um, or should I say good reasons? That is the reason. That's a good reason why that might not work. Um, in contrast, shareholders, it's a very different calculation because if you go back to the little bit of algebra I had, um, when we have a vote, um, first of all, the property rights are very well um, defined because we own the firm. Um, remember, we bought the shares at date zero. We're now at date one. We are the shareholders. Also, um, the majority can impose its will on the minority. That's one of the things about uh, corporate voting. Um, if the majority votes um, to go clean, and let's suppose you were a purely selfish person um, and you voted dirty, well, you know, you're outvoted. And then um, the capital loss will be shared among all of the shareholders, including you. There's no avoiding it. The company's going to... Um, spend the 20 out of their profits, out of their income. And as a shareholder, you are going to bear um, your proportionate burden. So there's no free rider problem. You can't escape it. It's a bit like um, a tax. You know, it's the same reason that um, we think with large numbers, uh, cozy and bargaining is um, uh, going to fail. And so, um, you know, we finance public goods like national defense or something like that out of um, compulsory taxation. Um, we don't ask people whether they want to contribute. We force them to contribute. The majority votes for it. This is democracy. You know, we have a government voted in by the majority, but then the minority has to pay their taxes. Um, and that's exactly what's happening here with a shareholder vote. So I think there's a big difference. And, and I think that's why this can work well in, in situations where cozy and bargaining doesn't. Uh, since you mentioned about the majority ruling, would you would you not say that then the lambda that we would be interested in is a lambda of the median voter in this case? It is, exactly. But in my calculations, in fact, yes, it is precisely the lambda of the median voter. But if theta is small for everybody, then, um, you know, the median is likely to be, you know, positive. 
and so we're okay, then it's going to, then the argument works. Cool. Thank you so much, Professor. That's all I need for the median to be positive, right. which is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, not incredibly close to zero, but, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or something, that will be enough. Thank you. Um, I believe we have time for one last question. Um, would you mute your, uh, mute yourself, Dan? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your insightful lecture, Professor. Uh, I was wondering whether this model or this duality, this delicate balance in voice and exit could be extrapolated into a much greater macroeconomic perspective. Uh, for instance, do you think that, the, that voice is just as underappreciated with respect to countries using international institutions to participate, uh, to kind of cajole other countries into adopting certain policies they deem more ethically compatible? Or do you think that divestment, such as when sovereign wealth funds, for instance, the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, overtly divest from, uh, let's say, uh, dirty companies in China or Russia or the developing world, provide a better alternative to influencing policy decisions? Well, um, okay, I think you raised several points. So first of all, the Norwegian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, I, I've, sp um, I've actually talked to some of those, the people who run that, and my understanding is they engage in voice as well as exit. In other words, they are uh, putting pressure on management, uh, sometimes not through a formal vote, but rather, you know, because they are large shareholder, um, you know, they can get an audience with uh, management and they can say, I mean, one thing that a mutual fund, an institution, by the way, notice they are representing lots of small individuals, but they are big themselves. And they could say to a, a company board, uh, you know, we really think you should be moving in this direction. And by the way, if you don't, we're not going to vote for your for you next time you come up for election. And this is the kind of pressure that can be quite effective. And I think that the Norwegian fund does that as well as no doubt, uh, sometimes just saying, you know, we're not gonna buy shares in that company because it's too dirty for us. Um, I think what you have to do is, um, uh, you know, think of my example of, um, you know, Facebook say, I mean, you could say, we're never going to, a change uh, Facebook's behavior because Zuckerberg has control. So there's no point um, in trying to exercise voice there. So all we can do is exit. But in some other company where there isn't a majority, um, you know, there, there isn't a person with a controlling state, well, there um, we should perhaps try voice. So um, I think you have to look at the circumstances. Um, I think also I, I should make clear, I mean, people use voice um, much more broadly than I have in my talk. So, you know, they think uh, somebody um, complaining about something, that's voice. Um, you know, consumers, for example, can, um, well, we talked about, I, I gave the example of the fur free campaign. Um, you know, consumers can make a fuss about something and, um, you could say that's voice. It's not voice, and, and I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to deny that, but here I'm using voice um, to refer to, the, to, to what people with votes can do. They can actually use their control rights. So sometimes you have those control rights, you can use them. Sometimes um, you would have to use the other kind of voice where you just make a fuss, but that can also sometimes be effective. So I think it all depends on the circumstances. Thank you very much, P Professor Hart, for joining us today. Uh, I believe any other questions? I can, you know, I'm still. If anybody, we haven't had any oh. any questions from women. <laughs> That's great. Um, maybe, women, maybe Sarah, you would like to ask a question. Um, hmm. but you don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, I was. So um, I was thinking, should big firms, big companies have such power over decisions that may have welfare implications to 
you know, globally. Um, and I, it was kind of inspired by what recently, what the big tech firms are doing. Um, it seems like they can decide to make someone or a group of people disappear with, with an instant click, click um, on, the, on the computer. Uh, yeah. And that kind of makes me wonder a little. Uh, that's a very good question or issue. Um, let me just say two things in response to that. So first of all, um, my argument that um, we should listen to what shareholders want. I, I do not want to suggest that's a panacea. As I've said, I mean, it's not a substitute for, well, I mean, it's not um, that government action couldn't be important. Yes, it's not a substitute for it, except to the extent that the government isn't doing its job. It can sometimes be a substitute, but sometimes shareholders may have the wrong goal. So if a company is very big, um, you know, it's possible the shareholders um, would want to exert monopoly power, would want their company to act as a monopolist because it has a lot of um, market power. And we would, um, you know, as economists, we would say, well, that's not likely to be efficient. So that's a case where the government should step in and, um, you know, limit the monopoly power. So I don't want to deny that. And I think it could also be the case in, in the examples you've given uh, you know, cutting, um, deciding who's on your platform or who, or who isn't on your platform. Um, on the other hand, it's also the case that sometimes shareholders um, will, because they, uh, you know, I don't know if you ask the owners of, um, I guess it's not going to be the case of Google, but maybe Twitter, you know, if Twitter was asked if the owners of Twitter, and I may, I may be wrong, I'm not really sure whether that is, uh, has dispersed ownership, but maybe it does. So if they, they were asked, do you want Trump uh, not to be able to tweet, you know, um, they might decide the same as the CEO or they might not, I don't know. Sometimes they would perhaps um, decide in a socially better way, sometimes not, but I, I think the point is that when companies get big, we know that they, they may not do the socially correct thing, even if they're listening to their shareholders. So um, that's why this is not the, you know, complete, what I'm suggesting is not the complete solution by any means. Um, we need government, but government often, um, as I keep on saying, I don't think it does its job. And that's particularly case, think of a multinational company a multinational company. A multinational company may be much better able to um, internalize some environmental things because it operates across countries. So it actually could, um, if, if the shareholders are, are sort of have the right attitudes, it could actually do a lot of good in a situation where the governments of those countries are failing to coordinate. So I think sometimes size can be actually beneficial because it allows you to cross borders. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have, uh, we have a woman from, uh, from the audience raising her okay. hand. Let's, let's hear her, yes. Uh, hi, Professor. Thank, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It was really, really enlightening. I have a fairly generic question. So the everything you described sort of applies very naturally to social issues that everyone is affected by, say yeah. environment. But let's talk about say gender specific issues, for instance, women empowerment, which only affects certain people directly, right? In, in, in such, such sort of group specific social issues, does either voice or exit strategy work? I mean, or, and, or yeah. which one is better or preferable? Well, so, uh, sorry, you're talking about women being, what, employed at a company or on the board or something like that? Or any, what, what? Any, any, any kind of issue for that matter. For instance, women in a company are being, you know, traditionally discriminated. Now, all the women in that firm decide that, you know, we are going to raise our voice against it. But oh. there may be too few yeah. on the board to, you know, have any say at all. Right. So, yes, I, that's an excellent example. And I think that 
that's a situation where voice, not of the kind. So that's, a, I think, a case where the, uh, you know, the women employees don't have any formal control rights. Uh, so rather they have its voice in the sense of complaints. They have maybe some bargaining power if they are, particularly if they're highly skilled or if they're unionized, um, then they could say, you know, uh, if you don't do something, we're not going to work here anymore. I mean, they have that sort of power. And I don't want to deny that at all. But I think it's also the case that the shareholders of such a company might also, you know, care about these. So, you know, people talk about ESG, environmental social governance. And um, again, shareholders being you know, regular people, some cross section of the population, although probably, you know, on the richer side, but, you know, some of them may be quite liberal and they might actually say, we think it's very important for our company to have more women in prominent positions. So, you know, they could be pushing, they could be using their votes to push for that kind of thing at the same time as the, the women employees are pushing. So I would think they're probably complementary things. Yeah, that that's, a fair, that's a fair point. In fact, even in the case of environment, it's quite possible some people don't believe in climate change to begin with. So there's always that. I mean, of course, yes. I, I mean, when I say, uh, you know, I'm taking a rather conservative position in a way. I'm saying the company's owned by shareholders. And so shareholders have the right to decide what the company does. And in general, it, that's ne not necessarily going to be profit maximization. But I fully acknowledge that uh, sometimes the shareholders might have very different views from my own. For example, going back to the, uh, the um, gun retailer, I mean, it's possible that the shareholders of this retailer say, we love guns and we want, you know, more of them sold. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be happy with that outcome, but it is sort of in a way the corporate democratic outcome. Yeah, and, and and I'm guessing in such a situation, even exit strategy doesn't work very well. I mean, if you're the only one who, who hates guns. Um, right, but if you could get a movement going, maybe then these pro-gun shareholders would also um, say, you know what, no one's shopping at Walmart anymore. Um, actually, it turns out Walmart was an interesting example. It, 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 um, I wish I, I'm, um, someone did an empirical strategy, uh, an empirical study of their decision to stop selling certain kinds of weapons. And I think it turned out, you know, uh, this is among the customers, not among the show, that's, you know, more liberal customers, more of them came to, or more um, in democratic areas, they got more customers when they um, announced that they weren't gonna, weren't gonna sell weapons. And in Republican areas, they got fewer customers. So, you know, it all depends um, who's in the majority, whether it's going to hit people in the pocket or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very enlightening. You're welcome. Great, Sally. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the talk. It's a very worthy course to study and something a very evident model indeed. I'd just like to ask perhaps an even more generic question, but it's a short one. Yeah. What advice do you have for people who are trying to find their own research question for their first paper? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm often asked. Um, the, so what, are you, a, a, um, are you doing a PhD? I'm actually an undergrad, but oh. okay. So what, 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 uh, what kind of paper, uh, what's it for? Economic research paper, anything from say theoretical structure or empirical. Oh. Okay, but you're thinking about, it could be the same question that a, a PhD student would ask about how to start research really. Is yes, it's a fairly generic question because I'm also yeah. asking on behalf of a few friends from different I see. levels. I see. And you know what? I wish I had the answer to that question because it's uh, it would be so great to have an answer. I mean, my answer is that there isn't much of an answer. I, I think uh, when you start research, uh, I mean, different people do it in different ways. Um, if I if I think 
back to what my own experience. I mean, I, I remember when I was um, writing my PhD thesis, I hadn't really done much writing before that of anything. I think I did a master's. Yeah, I mean, I did a master's thesis at the University of Warwick. And, you know, I just took some question that was in the literature and I did some little twiddle on it. I think it was very boring. Uh, but as a, for my PhD, I had to do something more imaginative and um, it was really tough. I was sort of looking around for some good question. And um, I, I remember, you know, and I think this is true of lots of uh, most people that, um, you know, for a long time I had absolutely nothing and I was feeling pretty anxious and depressed about it. And then one day, something struck me and you know it turned into a paper i think the first one wasn't very good but then the second one was better um but i think you know different people do it differently some people are very much influenced by what's already in the literature i think when you're starting out you have to be actually um you probably read some paper and you think I, I see some way to extend that. It could be empirical, it could be theoretical, I'm not sure it matters. I, I remember uh, in my own case um, that I read a paper and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I think I could extend that in the following way. And then I found out that actually that extension had been done before the paper I read was written, but the person who wrote the paper I read hadn't been very fair about describing the prior work. So I was very disappointed to find that this um, extension was already out there. So that's often going to happen. But I would say, you know, start small and um, probably with, you know, some wrinkle on the literature, but then pretty quickly try to have bigger ideas. So what I always say to doctoral students is, um, you know, once you've sort of got a bit of the hang of writing things, you need to start aiming higher um, because otherwise, um, and again, this is not your particular situation, but if you, um, I, I always feel that um, if somebody hasn't aimed very high with their doctoral work, then they're probably going to stay at that level <laughs> throughout their career, you know, because they've got used to it. So there's also... Um, but certainly at the beginning, I, I think doing some small extension of something um, that, that you've read could be a good way. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, we have another student raising his hand. Would you like to unmute, please? Yeah, sure. Um, Professor Hart, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, my question was back to the model. So I'm, I'm just curious that um, what is, do you foresee like in the case where, because you assume that like each individual here have some level of like um, social responsibility or have some kind of like chase for it. But it, what if like some are like strictly say like profit driven or especially the case when we consider institution investor where they are kind of like a lot of like the hedge funds, hedge funds they are run by, for example, a hedge fund portfolio managers who are under more like a very single-minded um, profit-driven cases, or even, or even they have like their own social uh, preference, but they are kind of like governed or say managed by a such an um, KPI or saying like want to achieve a maximum profits, then how does this kind of things can be, how can this be say modeled or how can this say be put into this model and be considered saying like there's a conflict between this shareholders? Uh, well, I think actually at some level it's perfectly easy to put it in because you just need a group of people with lambda equals zero. And I, I wasn't denying that that could be possible. And those people, um, you know, if your lambda really is zero, you would um, vote, um, in my example, you'd vote dirty because you'd just be looking at the capital loss and you wouldn't put care at all about anything else. Um, so then, you know, it comes back to a question that was asked about the median lambda. As long as the median lambda is positive, you know, when theta is very small for everybody, as uh, you can have a group of lambda equals zero people, as long as they're not in the majority. Um, if they're in the majority, then um, they will always vote to stay dirty. Um, 
in terms of the institutions, I think hedge fund, the, the kind of institutions that we're talking about with these um, uh, public companies tend not to be hedge funds. I think they're, they're more, you know, the vanguards, uh, the Black Rocks, uh, State Street, Fidelity, these kinds of institutions. So these, mutual funds that has yeah. like long-term investment range versus, right. for example, right. and, hedge fund that's more um, aggressive and short-term. Yeah. And those that, as I say, they should be asking, I think the natural um, extension of, you know, if, I, if, if we are saying companies should find out from their shareholders um, how they trade off profits with, you know, the environment or social things or whatever it is. Similarly, these institutions need to ask their investors the same thing. And so, you know, you, you can extend the idea. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, I believe we still have time for one more. Um, uh, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hart. I was just wondering, uh, you were saying that a problem is that government does not do the right thing, which would, I, I mean, that would translate into voters do not choose the right policy, essentially. Um, and if I look to myself, I'm thinking, when I invest as a shareholder, my lambda is probably lower than when I vote in political election. So I'm thinking, wouldn't that sort of fal falsify your, your belief that uh, shareholders will vote the right way? When they fail to do so in general election, or okay, am that's I just an, very irrational? Yes. No, that's an interesting question. I don't know why your lambda should be. I think you are. You should have a single lambda. Why is your lambda varying? I mean, I would ask you that. I mean, I don't quite see that. I think, um, but. So I think the point is that in the corporate context, people haven't being encouraged to think this way. So once they started, you know, if you really had a vote on whether, you know, an oil company should become cleaner, you might view that very much the way um, you think of a political choice. I think one of the differences though, is it would be very focused as opposed to, you know, the typical political choice is, you know, you're voting for a candidate who's going to, you know, who has a position on many things. You're not, it's not a single issue um, campaign. Um, in fact, we, we talk in the paper about referenda. Referenda are closer to um, the, these corporate votes where, you know, you have a referendum on a single issue. Um, of course, um, in the UK, there was this small referendum about Brexit. Um, that was a single issue uh, in a way. Um, but we also have, certainly where I live ma in Massachusetts, we um, have um, quite often referenda on very specific issues. We had one on whether marijuana should be legalized and the, um, it was voted to do so. Um, and that is, um, I think, um, so I think when it comes to uh, referenda, you know, people are, uh, uh, particularly on a simple issue like legalization of marijuana, um, that's very much very similar to what we're, what we're talking about. So, um, but there aren't that many of those, right, in the political context, that's the difference. And also, as I said, um, you need coordination across um, uh, jurisdictions, which may be within a country um, or across countries, and that's very difficult. So, what, you know, I gave the example of a multinational company that operates in many countries. So there, the shareholders may be actually uniquely um, in a position to have an influence in a way that no voter could. No, no voter in a single country could. So, I don't know whether that's an answer, uh, but I think, um, you know, I, I'm all in favor of more political voting as well, but I, I think you should, you should uh, um, I think you need to spend some time figuring out your lambda and bring the two lambdas together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, do we have more questions? No? Oh. Okay, um, so thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, Professor Hart, for um, 
um, this wonderful talk. We truly enjoyed it. Um, next Sand Club talk, talk, we will have Dr. Paul Milgram from Stanford University talk to us about truthful auctions. Please stay tuned to our um, Economic Society's Facebook page. Uh, I will send a link to the chat very shortly. Uh, make, make sure you give it a like so you can stay tuned. Um, yeah, this, I guess that's it for today, everyone. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you have a lovely evening uh, or afternoon and um, yeah. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. You. Bye, everybody. It was nice to uh, chat with you. You too. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. I will stop the recording.